What's up, everybody? Hey, beautiful people. I got a hell of a show for you today. I've got two-time presidential candidate Jill Stein joining me today. Yes, indeed. And this show, this show has, this episode has both Jill Stein and Chris Hedges. Now, that's a fuck of an episode right there. Uh, Jill Stein uh, is going to be joining in the human human fleshy form, and uh, Chris Hedges is going to be joining in the article column form. So I got both for you. Uh, if you want to see Chris Hedges in the fleshy form, I, I had him on a few months ago. But anyway, Jill Stein will be here. We're going to dig into a lot of things about uh, canceling student loan debt, uh, about her fight with the FEC, uh, Federal Election Commission, about uh, uh, about climate change. A lot to talk about third parties. A lot to talk about to, to Jill Stein about the 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 always wonderful Jill Stein. So uh, we will get to that soon. She'll be here in a bit. But I want to start off with talking about uh, what's new with, with, with Ukraine. There, there's always updates. It is horrifying. And so we've got to keep talking about it because it is leading us towards a nuclear oblivion, which, you know, I'm not a fan of. I Because I, here's the thing. I have tickets to see the fucking Rolling Stones in like two months. And I need the nuclear oblivion to be pushed off just a bit. Okay, just a bit. And then I can do that. Okay, I don't actually have tickets to so that. That would be cool if I did, though. I would, I would totally be for that. But that being said, I'm still opposed to nuclear oblivion. Uh, oh, before I forget, uh, although I'll, I'll, I'll talk more about it later, but uh, I have live shows coming up in London, Berlin, and just added Stockholm. How's that for a fucking tour? It's been so long since I played Europe. It's been like years. So, uh, yeah. Very excited. Anyway, those tickets, Berlin and London are already up at my, not this website, not leecamp.net, but leecamp.com. You click schedule, you can get your tickets there. Stockholm will be up soon. Anyway, let's get to what Chris Hedges wrote. And and also, it, it involved, uh, he's talking about some, he'll, he'll mention some revelations that have just come out about how long we will be in Ukraine, in our proxy war in Ukraine, for those who don't think it's a proxy war, I've played the clip multiple times of former CIA head Leon Panetta saying, this is a proxy war. Whether you, He said whether you want to call it that or not. Uh, and of course, he's not the only one. There's many others uh, calling it a proxy war because it is. It's, it is a proxy war and we want it to go on as long as possible, despite the fact that the sanctions are all boomeranging and smacking us in the face like, like pissing into the wind on the front of a boat. The piss is just spraying right on back into our face. And we're, and and our government, the fucking U.S. government, is standing there going, yeah, this feels about right. This is, uh, everything's going as planned. They just keep pissing. At no point do they think maybe we should turn around, maybe go to the side of the boat, maybe, 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 maybe uh, hold off, cut off the stream for a minute. No, they, they're just sitting there pissed looping back, spraying in all of our faces, and they're going, eh, I'm glad we came up with this plan. This is going swimmingly. Oh, by the way, please take a second to share this and click like, then thumbs up and all those things. I really appreciate it. And if you want to join the free email list, text the word redacted to 33777 if you're in the United States. All right, so Chris Edges, uh, yesterday his column, <clears throat> Ukraine and the politics of permanent war. He says, no one, including the most bullish supporters of Ukraine, expect the nation's war with Russia to end soon. The fighting has been reduced to artillery duels across hundreds of miles of front lines and creeping advances and retreats. Ukraine, like Afghanistan, will bleed for a very long time. And of course, who suffers the most in the middle of this? Uh, innocent civilians. On, 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 you know, whether, whether you, whether you think Russia had to do this because NATO was just pushing on their border and this, this and, and, and 15,000 uh, Russians have been killed in the Donbass region over the past several years, even if you're on that team uh, or that belief system, still the ones who suffer the most from this are innocent civilians. And if you're in the other belief system that, oh no, it doesn't matter uh, that, that U.S. is funding Nazis and putting missiles on Russia's border, still Russia is wrong to invade Ukraine. 
if you're on that side, still, you know who suffers the most? Fucking innocent civilians. And that's why I'm anti-war. I'm opposed to all this shit. And that's why I'm one of the most censored comedians in America. On August 24th, the Biden administration announced yet another massive military aid package to Ukraine worth nearly $3 billion. It will take, and here's the, I think the key point of this entire column. That aid package will take months and in some cases years for this military equipment to reach Ukraine. So if the U.S. didn't think and want this to go on for years, why would they allot weapons that they know won't get there for months, if not years? So it is basically Washington tacitly admitting that this is going to go on for fucking years. Uh, In another sign that Washington assumes the conflict will be a long war of attrition uh, is that it has just announced, and I didn't know about this, that it will give a name to the U.S. military assistance, quote unquote, mission in Ukraine and make it a separate command overseen by two or three star, by a two or three star general. So they're giving it a name like it's a U.S. mission. They have decided they are going to call the U.S. mission in Ukraine a specific name, you know, like Iraqi freedom or whatever they called that one. And then uh, you know, liber- liberation, uh, ass monkeys or whatever. They, they come up with a name for all this shit. And so this is an admission by the U.S. government quietly that, that, that this is a U.S. mission. This is, I mean, we all know it's a proxy war, but they're trying to keep it a little bit quiet. Uh, not Leon Panetta, apparently. And so this is yet another admission that this is a U.S. proxy war and also that this is going to go on for many months, likely years. Since August 2021, Biden has approved more than $8 billion in weapons transfers from existing stockpiles known as drawdowns to be shipped to Ukraine, which do not require congressional approval. Another key point, many of us, including myself, have been talking about the number of billion dollars of weapons that have been sent to Ukraine to be put into the hands of often Nazis in Ukraine, <clears throat> um, not all Nazis, you know, so, some are just Nazi-ish, but many Nazis, many, m- many, I find that any Nazis is many Nazis. Ma- any Nazis is just a few Nazis too much. Any number of Nazis, few Nazis too much. In my book, in my book, that's how that works. So, but this is a key point that many of us have been talking about you know, this many billion dollars that Congress has approved to send weapons and aid to, yeah, you know, when they say aid, what they mean is grin aid, grenade. That's what they, whatever, whatever the U.S. Congress is sending aid to Ukraine. They just left off the G-R-E-N. <laughs> just $40 billion of grin aid is going to Ukraine. Uh, anyway, but that we are ignoring in that number of billions of dollars sent to Ukraine, all of us just about are ignoring the $8 billion of weapons that are just being transferred from like Afghanistan to Ukraine. So basically, as Biden said, you know, we're leaving Afghanistan. So he pulls out the troops, starts an economic war that's actually killing more people in Afghanistan than we were killing with bombs. Isn't that nice when our dollars kill more people than bombs? That makes you feel good, doesn't it? That gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling inside, doesn't it? Um, even when we're, we're, we're stopping a, uh, having actual troops and bases in Afghanistan, we're taking those weapons, transferring to U- Ukraine, and that doesn't require congressional approval as apparently our wars never require con- congressional approval anymore, right? We haven't, congressional, Congress hasn't approved of a war since Vietnam. Uh, they just sit around and go, oh, that's interesting. We're at war with such and such a country. Fill in the blank. Um, but so this is $8 billion just transferred from probably mostly Afghanistan to Ukraine. Uh, here's Chris Hedges continuing. Including humanitarian assistance, replenishing, depleting U.S. weapons stocks and expanding U.S. troop presence in Europe, Congress has approved over $53.6 billion, $13.6 billion in March, 
and a further $40.1 billion in May since Russia's February 24th invasion. War takes precedence over the most serious existential threats we fight. They would rather put all this money into war, into death, into killing, into blowing up infrastructure, all of that, then they want to put it into health, into medical care, into our infrastructure at home. They'd rather spend it blowing up bridges in, Af in, in Ukraine uh, to, that they claim they're going to stop Russian forces than fixing bridges in the U.S. where we have 60,000 structurally deficient bridges. Uh, yeah, that's where that money just goes to bombs instead of bridges. And, and you know, of course, environmental threats, climate crisis. Now, they're putting... You know, we're spending 370 times, 370 times as much on our military next year or starting this year than we are on the climate crisis. 370 times. The militarists who have waged permanent war who've waged permanent war costing trillions of dollars over the past two decades, have invested heavily in controlling the public narrative. The enemy, whether it be Saddam Hussein one year or Vladimir Putin another, is always the epitome of evil, right? The new Hitler. Each guy is the new Hitler. Saddam Hussein was the new Hitler. And Assad was the new Hitler. And, uh, and uh, Taliban figures or Al-Qaeda heads were the new Hitler. And, uh, and now Putin is the new Hitler. Uh, and then Chris Hedges continues, those we support are always heroic defenders of liberty and democracy. We are bombing democracy into your fucking faces. Be ready for it. Anyone who questions the righteousness of the cause is accused of being an agent of foreign power and a traitor. And of course, Chris Hedges and I both know what that's like. We were both, until it was shut down by U.S. sanctions, both uh, had TV shows at RT where... I was at RT because guess what? They never fucking told me what to say. They never told me what to say, never told me what not to say. From day one, I said I was opposed to the invasion, even if I want to talk about what's causing the Russian invasion. Uh, and Chris Hedges did the same because Chris Hedges is also anti-war. So, you know, that's where we stood. Doesn't matter. People still say, oh, no, if you, if you speak about any of the reality of what's going on in this proxy war, then you're just Russian agent. Doesn't matter if you're uh, opposed to the war. Doesn't matter if you're uh, just speaking the reality. Doesn't matter. Uh, you know, well, it was, it, truth is, uh, is, is apparently pro-Russian is what they're saying. Because, you know, you speak the truth, you're called pro-Russian. So I guess apparently truth is pro-Russian. I was unaware of that. I had no idea. Um, to continue from Chris Edges, in the face of this barrage, no dissent is permitted. And this is, I had missed this story somehow, came out a few days ago. Uh, but let me, let me see when it, when did it, when was it kind of revealed? Uh, 8-10, so August, August 10th, uh, Multipolarista and others were reporting on it. So I somehow missed this story. In the face of this barrage, no dissent is permitted. CBS News caved to pressure, caved to pressure and retracted its own documentary, which charged that only 30% of arms shipped to Ukraine were making it to the front lines, with the rest siphoned off to the black market, a finding that was separately reported by U.S. journalist Lindsey Snell. CNN also acknowledged there is no oversight of weapons once they arrive in Ukraine. A few weeks ago, I played for you a hidden camera video of some of these U.S. missiles being sold in the back of a fucking, you know, Volvo or some shit, the back of some station wagon. Uh, and they're going, these U.S. missiles that we're sending to Ukraine to be used by some of the Nazis there uh, are being sent and put into the black market and they're being sold for like $20,000 a pop, which, of course, for a missile is like fucking nothing. And, uh, and I showed you video of that a few weeks ago. But this is CBS and CNN and other networks reporting on how only 30% of all the fucking bombs, guns, missiles, all the shit we're sending to Ukraine 
30% is actually showing up in that fight in our proxy war because it's all getting siphoned off, sold for cash into the black market. Who knows where it'll be used? Who knows what fucking children it'll kill? Doesn't matter to the U.S. government. Chris Hedges says, war is the primary business of the U.S. empire and the bedrock of the economy. And actually, I want to show you, uh, let's see, uh, Multipolarista did a good article on CBS censoring their own documentary. When, basically, when they were called out. Basically, when Ukraine said, hey, you're not allowed to tell the truth about the fact that, web, that, our, that the U.S. arms aren't getting to the front line, uh, they censored them. Under Ukrainian government pressure, CBS News censored its own documentary called Arming Ukraine, which showed that just around 30% of the weapons Western governments had sent actually go to the front lines with widespread corruption and black markets. Under Ukrainian government pressure, major U.S. media outlet CBS News censored the documentary that it produced. The report estimated that of the tens of billions of dollars worth of weapons that Western governments have sent to help Ukraine wage a proxy war against Russia, just around 30% have actually made it to the front lines. People involved in, in the Ukraine arms rat line tell, wouldn't it be great if that were one of the, instead of, instead of news line or front line or whatever, one of the CBS shows was called rat line. I feel like that would be far more accurate. But anyway, people involved in the Ukraine arms rat line told CBS in the documentary that there was significant corruption. Yeah, big surprise considering Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries before this invasion, proxy war, all of that. Uh, people involved in the arms rat line said that Due to power lords and oligarchs, much of the military equipment was being siphoned off or sold on the black market in what was kind of a black hole. CBS News published these revelations on August 4th in a joint article and video titled, quote, Why Military Aid to Ukraine Doesn't Always Get to the Front Lines, Like 30% of It Reaches Its Final Destination. That was actually the headline. In the headline, they said 30% of it gets to the destination. The video was clearly thoroughly biased against Russia, which you wouldn't expect anything different from CBS, from a U.S. government uh, state-run outlet. I call it state-run because we're in inverted totalitarianism ruled by the corporate state. And so if corporate America runs the government and corporate America runs CBS, then CBS is a state-run outlet. Uh, so, of course, it's going to be biased against Russia and in favor of Ukraine. However, even with that bias it was not propagandistic enough for ukraine and its western backers under intense pressure cbs news was forced to retract its own documentary on august 7th it then changed the title of the accompanying article to quote why military aid in ukraine may not always get to the front line we don't know what the percentages are we don't maybe 95 percent who knows what the percentages are i'd rather not say right now where it's it's we and and please do not use the wayback machine please do not look at our website from two days ago whatever you do don't read the same article two days ago not that it's any different it's exactly the same no reason to look back on what it used to say no reason at all um, so Ukraine's foreign minister condemned CBS on Twitter, said it was a good first step, but not enough. Uh, and then C I love CBS tweeted out, we removed a tweet promoting our recent documentary, Arming Ukraine, which quoted the founder of the nonprofit Blue Yellow, uh, his assessment in late April that only around 30% of the aid was reaching the front lines. <laughs> I mean, you're quoting a guy. So it's not even like CBS was saying that they believe it's 30. They quote a guy who is, a, 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 you know, understands what's going on there as saying it's 30 percent. And that wasn't allowed. And something else Hedges uh, doesn't mention in his article. And I covered this on my new show, The Most Censored News, which you can watch, of course, at LeeCamp.net or LeeCamp.com uh, or uh, all the other all the many other places. But yeah. I uh, hope you'll check out my new show, The Most Censored News. Anyway, what one thing that I mentioned in that is uh, Scott Ritter's analysis and consortium news of the 
the U.S. Congress sending funds, an official was actually there as the Ukraine created a list of journalists who were, quote, journalists and politicians who were, quote, information terrorists. On that list was Rand Paul, the fucking Congressman Rand Paul, even though he's a Republican. And the reason he's on that list is because he was demanding, um, he was demanding oversight of the billions of dollars sent to Ukraine. That's all he was demanding. And look, Rand Paul's a piece of shit for other reasons. But on this, all he was demanding is oversight of the billions of dollars sent to Ukraine, much of it landing in the hands of Nazis. And for that, he was put on a, a list of information terrorists. Later, they added Roger Waters, the uh, you know former lead of Pink Floyd, who has been amazing on, on speaking out for Palestine, for Assange, for so many great causes. Uh, and I had him on Redacted Tonight a while back. But they added Roger Waters to the list of information terrorists. And this is a, 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 a Ukrainian organization that the U.S. is helping fund and is overseeing. He's like stage managing. Like a member from the State Department was uh, was sitting in the audience when they were doing this quietly, you know, going, excellent, excellent. I'm so proud of my little boy. Look, that's my little boy up there. You see what he's doing? Isn't that beautiful? Look what he's doing up there. Yeah. Ah, love that kid. Love that kid. Look at him. Colin, Colin fucking U.S. congressman. War, uh, uh, info, info terrorists. And also, by the way, they... They... Uh, they later uh, said they want to pr they, they want to try and prosecute those people for war crimes as well. So maybe soon a U.S. funded and stage managed group in Ukraine uh, committee, government committee or whatever in Ukraine will try and prosecute a U.S. congressman for war crimes only for saying that he wants oversight of the money in Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, it's fucking... Oh, God. It'd be a hilarious, like, fiction if it weren't so, <laughs> so fucking terrifying. It'd be like, it'd be like a, a, a sci-fi, an awesome sci-fi novel where you're like, this is some dystopian shit if it weren't reality. Let's see. I got one more story. And then I think uh, Jill Stein should be arriving. So, oh, let me make sure that was all I had in the uh, Chris Hedges article. Yeah, so Chris Hedges article is on Sheer Post. You can you can read that there. And uh, Multipolarista is an outlet uh, written by mainly by Ben Norton. He does amazing work, and you can read all that stuff there. Um. And pretty much all this stuff is also, if you want it all in one place, if you don't want to have to go to source after source after source, go to radindiemedia.com, R-A-D-I-N-D-I-E, media.com. It's free to go there. It's not a profit-seeking venture. I created it, it uh, with Eleanor Goldfield. It has no, there's no sponsors, there's no ads. So check it out. All right, so here's another article from the UK, which goes in, speaks to how workers have new power. And it also uh, has a connection to Ukraine, to our ridiculous, insane sanctions on Ukraine, well, on Russia, uh, that are you know, blowing back in our faces. Um, so this is from the Canary, another great outlet. Strikes across the UK as regulator lifts energy price cap by 80%. So... This is saying that U that UK energy prices may skyrocket 80% because they've just removed the cap uh, and or increased it by 80%. And of course, energy costs are a really tough, a really tough uh, piece of the lives of so many in the UK and US. Um, and, and, you know, it doesn't, this is the type of thing that doesn't really impact the rich because their energy costs are a tiny little piece of their budget. They don't really give a fuck, but what it is a giant punch to the face or who a giant punch to the face to is the poor. And that's why they don't care to do this. A new wave of strikes are underway across the UK from postal workers to workers to baristas, organized labor 
is turning out on picket lines against the backdrop of looming energy cost strikes. Workers across the UA, U, UK are fighting back by withdrawing labor, sharing their experiences, and on one occasion, surfing around ports at high speed. I don't even know what that means. But, uh, I mean, I guess you could surf at high speeds, but I don't think you could surf in a circle at high speeds. Oh, if you had like a, if you're like kind of water skiing or waterboarding or something, it's not called waterboarding, is it? That's, that's a form of torture, yeah. So uh, they probably weren't waterboarding around the ports. But So the strikes come as Don't Pay, the name which is a, Cam- which is campaigning, so Don't Pay is an organization, is campaigning to encourage people to refuse to pay extortionate energy bills. Reported an 80% hike had been nodded through. I guess that's a, that's, that must be in a British expression, nodded through. Had nodded through by regulator Offgem. The hikes emphasize how important bottom, bottom up resistance is right now and a number of unions are taking action as we speak postal workers are striking as part of the communication workers union over pay royal mail bosses i like that so-called royal mail you know if there's one thing look i'm a fan of mail i think i think we should fund our postal service i still think mail is important but royal really it's really royal you know you get a uh, 80% of your mail is like fucking ads for an HVAC or like some, some bullshit or, you know, you, you accidentally gave your, your uh, address to that you know, or they got it off your credit card when you bought that, uh, that, that sex swing at that store. So now you're getting the, 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 the ads in the mail of various uh, uh, sex devices that you, you don't even understand how many people would be involved? Where's that strap go? I don't even know. Why are there that many buckles? You know, that kind of thing. You guys know how it is. We've all been there, right? Uh, and that, that's what mail is. Is it still royal? Is that still royal? When it's just a dildo catalog? Is it a royal dildo catalog? Because it came in the royal mail? Anyway, postal workers are striking as part of the Communication Workers Union over pay. Royal mail bosses have been paying themselves massive bonuses, even as the cost of living crisis ramps up you get the point but energy costs why are energy costs going up well because the u.s and our eu feudal states allies but let's be honest feudal states uh created a proxy war. i don't know if you're aware of this they created a proxy war in ukraine and they uh it's uh, it's 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 created uh, fucking rippling effects. The R- Russia has so basically the U.S. could put all these sanctions on Russia. Russia responded by saying, "Hey, you know, forty percent of all energy, all and I hate calling it energy. We should call it planetary death fluid. Um, but forty percent of all the planetary death fluid used by the EU and the UK it comes from Russia. So Russia said, "Well, guess what? If you're going to sanction us." How about you pay for all your oil in rubles? Now, what this does is it makes the ruble more powerful. So Russia has actually gotten back most of what they lost from these sanctions, uh, the, the price of the ruble and everything. And, uh, and so these sanctions have just sprung back in our face. Uh, when, and, and as you guys know, live, for those of you who live in the United States, uh, things are not getting better. Things are not looking good. And, and the U.S., the, the ruling class doesn't care because the overall goal of the ruling class is to create the, you know, is to create this uh, sp- great splitting of the global economies and try and isolate Russia, isolate China, because the U.S. wants to continue to have hegemony around the world. So, you know, they don't really give a shit if a lot of people suffer, especially a lot of poor people. So they're fine with that. And they're like, going great. So at the end of the day, they don't care if, uh, if, they, if all the sanctions boomerang back in our faces. But that being said, all right, so I got through those. And um, by the way, folks, uh, as you all know, the, uh, as per usual, in about 10 minutes, the feed will continue on just rumble.com slash Lee Camp. But uh, it's free to watch there. There's no, there's no paywall or anything. So rumble.com slash Lee Camp. Uh, that'll happen in like 10 minutes, just letting you know. Uh, so please join me over there. But all right, I would like to 
without further ado, and we'll and we'll be talking about some of the stuff I was just uh, bringing up. But uh, I want to bring in. Uh, I'd like to consider her a friend, but also uh, two-time presidential candidate and uh, amazing human being, Jill Stein. Really great to be with you, Lee. And um, as always, it's uh, you know very empowering and inspirational to catch your dialogue, your monologue, which I just heard the last bit of. And we well, need you. you. We need you when we need to hear you. And thank you for refusing to be silenced. <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> I just I just have to keep uh, starting new YouTube channels once a week. Is uh, is how it works. <laughs> I know what you mean. Uh, but, th but thank you for, for refusing to be silenced. I feel like uh, there, there's many, especially in the mainstream media and the, on the Democratic establishment, who would love it if you would stop uh, speaking out at, 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 at some time. Um, it's tough to know. Which, let, let's start with the thing that's in the news the most right now, which is uh, Biden has said he's canceling uh, $10,000, up to $10,000 of student loan debt for a percentage of those who are drowning under this debt. So he's canceling a percentage for a percentage. And I think you have to apply. And I think the application process ends in December. So I don't know. It may depend on how many people are aware of how to apply and then how many applications they approve and stuff like that. So that remains to be seen. But one, one thing I'd like to point out is that this is an idea that you and the Green Party have been talking about forever. And many in the mainstream mocked the idea of canceling student debt. They did, yes. And, um, you know, take a look at my, my Twitter account, if you like. Uh, DR, Jill Stein, DR, no period, um, where I just sort of summarized my feelings about this in a single tweet. Uh, you may recall hearing John Oliver, you know, just really... Uh, uh, rip us to shreds, that is student debtors, all 45 million of them, and myself for giving them a voice and and elevating this issue to the level that it deserves, which is really, you know, the headliner for a national dialogue. And I think we actually started calling for the end to student debt in my first campaign in 2012, and it was a big issue in 2016. And that's when John Oliver, you know, inadvertently helped us elevate the issue by ridiculing us uh, for that. And, you know, what was the source of his ridicule? It's that uh, he wanted, you know, he wanted a uh, complex financial explanation given in about, you know, 10 seconds in a soundbite. And, you know, it doesn't work that way. And, you know, how has Joe Biden justified his $10,000 bailout? You know, well, he basically didn't talk about justifying it at all, not even like where his authority comes from to do this, uh, which is a little shaky, in fact, and may wind up challenged and uh, rejected by the Supreme Court. And, you know, and he didn't talk about where the money would come from. But, you know, do they ever talk about where the money comes from when they're, you know, giving away a trillion dollars a year, essentially, to uh, military contractors, you know, or to the health insurance industry or the fossil fuel? magnates, uh, you know, who just got us into even deeper trouble with their deceptive so-called climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, this, this, is, this is a joke, you know, and, and I think it's certainly come back to bite uh, John Oliver. And I'm just waiting for him now to start ridiculing uh, Joe Biden for failing to provide a, a detailed economic explanation in 10 seconds. You know, <laughs> what a joke. Yeah, I, defending I, his I, I, I remember when that happened, and and I used to know John Oliver in New York a little bit. Uh, by I was maybe on three shows with him or something, uh, live stand-up shows, and very funny guy, very nice. The couple of times I met him, but when I saw some of the things he was doing on his show, it slowly became you know trashing you, uh, trashing Maduro and Venezuela, and just whole long anti-China segments, and it just started to sound more and more of like. State Department talking points, um, but so yeah, it, it was sad to see him uh, make that transition, and and you certainly didn't deserve uh, that that bullshit when it was happening, but uh, you know, and something else I think in this in Joe Biden uh, canceling, let's assume it goes through, let's assume he does it, even giving that the benefit of the doubt, uh, is that 
he's largely responsible for a lot of this uh, <laughs> massive loan debt balloon that is over everyone's head. Uh, he is the one who put forward the bill that, uh, that made it so that people couldn't get out from under this debt in the first place. Exactly. I mean, he spent, you know, 50 years essentially serving the financial services industry. And then he got uh, really pressured. And it's a tribute to the student debtors and their movement and their refusal to be silenced. Uh, you know, he got really pressured and cornered into doing something, you know, and what he's done is good. It's a good start, but it's really a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. And we'll be right back here in a couple of years because he backed away from his, you know, all of his promises, basically, except the promise to Wall Street that nothing would change. But he certainly backed away from the promise to make a uh, community college free, uh, you know, and to do something about the cost of higher education. And he's not doing that at all. So this is a very partial and temporary solution. It's helpful you know, and maybe one out of every three students in debt is going to have their debt erased. And it's some of the most vulnerable people who actually didn't get their degrees. And so they have really no hope of climbing out of this uh, debt trap. So it's a good thing, but, you know, yeah. let's give credit where it's due. And that that's to the movement and the movement needs to keep it up and really get a real solution. Yeah. I was speaking of the movement, uh, like, you know, you, you ran twice and they they still to this day, the, the liberals and the Democrats love to bring up your name and say, oh, you know, Jill Stein ruined it for us and stuff like that, uh, which is laughable on so many levels, uh, not to mention that the people who voted for you, most of them were not going to vote for Hillary Clinton anyway, but uh, if you weren't in the race. But um, I, do, do you feel like what you achieved... Uh, and perhaps what outside forces like third parties often achieve, even if they're not in Congress or in the presidency, is that with enough with enough action, with enough protest, with enough activism, these ideas become pretty mainstream. I mean, now canceling student debt is a mainstream dis uh, discussion, uh, even if Joe Biden didn't go through with it, it is a mainstream debate uh, when it was never talked about before several years ago. Uh, and, you know, the Green New Deal, even though the Democrats have cut out some of the most important parts, is now a mainstream discussion. Uh, to you, does that feel like some partial victory? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think it's really important for us to define the goals and the victory, you know, and I think it's a victory simply to fight. It's a victory to refuse to be silenced. And if we surrender on those counts, you know, then it's absolutely hopeless. You know, then our trajectory to uh, doomsday, you know, is only going to accelerate, which it's doing, you know, but if there's any hope of correcting this, it's by mobilizing the forces of democracy and actually giving people choices. And, you know, we uh, we put many issues on the table, many solutions on the table, you know, not to mention student debt, free public higher education, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, reparations for uh, for enslavement and uh, the, you know, criminal institution of slavery. Uh, we put many things on the table that are now seriously uh, debated and which are only being proven right. You know, we're not going to get out of this mess without really transformative solutions solutions that uh, are mostly within our agenda. You know, where did Medicare for all come from? That was Ralph Nader, actually, who uh, who really put that on the national agenda in his yep. 2000 race. So, you know, I mean, you can look at throughout throughout history, whether it's, um, you know, the 40 hour week or child labor laws, uh, you name it. I mean, it, it's always taken social movements and political opposition to force the hand of um, of the corrupt political establishment. But I think we're in a categorically different era right now. You know, we're really in the era of consequences. And that is, you know, climate change, uh, crushing economic inequality, endless escalating war, verging on nuclear. We can't afford to let the foxes run the chicken coop anymore. You may have seen recently this 1.6 billion dollar political donation from this uh, um, this manufacturing magnate. I don't know if you heard about this. This hasn't been covered much in mainstream media, 
$1.6 billion, the largest single political donation ever made was just recently identified like last week by a number of organizations, including The Lever, which is worth checking out. That's David Sirota's uh, watchdog group. He and several other groups basically identified this, I think through a leak, but the donation had been made in secret through um, a very covert network of uh, financial uh, shenanigans. Uh, it was made to a secret trust $1.6 billion, which essentially goes into the hands now of Leonard Leo. Leonard Leo is the guy who orchestrated the conservative takeover of the Supreme Court, running the Federalist Society and another secret network. This is kind of like, uh, sort of like ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Network, which used to be secret. Um, there are counterparts to that, which basically funnel billionaire donations from a handful of people uh, into these very powerful secretive groups that coordinate uh, election campaigns, that uh, coordinate public relations campaigns, like around uh, the Supreme Court nominations and so on. And they, uh, they just uh, corrupt not only our elections, but also our judicial system, our nonprofits, the um, you know, the appointment of judges, the actions of the um, uh, district, uh, rather the attorneys general, several state, well, a whole bunch of attorneys generals are networked through these organizations as well. They provide critical test cases, and then they provide a flurry of so-called amicus briefs. That is these briefs filed by nonprofits that appear to be coming out of the blue, but they're all actually carefully orchestrated and coordinated to create these campaigns, to give cover, and to essentially um, create this uh, hijack by the oligarchy of all of our institutions. Well, most of our institutions uh, of democracy. And, you know, which, ties into this other you know major campaign issue that has always been at the head of the agenda for greens and that is kind of a take back democracy or take back the promise of democracy because we've never actually had a democracy um but it's the promise of a democracy uh how do we restore that how do we get back some of the democratic institutions which at least were partially applied and one of those things is ranked choice voting or proportional representation mm -hmm. that yep. breaks through this um extortion it's extortion when you're telling people you know when you have these uh, these these saturation public relations campaigns that tell us that our votes are going to do the opposite of what we want. So you can't vote for what you want. You have to hold your nose and vote for the second thing, you know, the second worst thing instead of the worst thing. You vote for the second worst thing, but never vote for what you want. You know, that's really an extortion campaign. It extorts people out of fear to vote for what they don't want. But the right to vote doesn't mean really a damn thing unless you can apply that right to vote to what you want to vote for and who you want to vote for. Ranked choice voting would do that. And cutting through the stranglehold of big money on our elections is a critical uh, part of this as well. So there's much more to say about that $1.6 billion donation yeah. and what it's going to do and how to fight it. That's a so whole Something other I've been trying to get people to start repeating is, uh, you know, Something that that has been mentioned is that the the candidate who spends the most in the House wins over ninety percent of the time. Uh, when the candidate spends the most in the Senate wins over eighty percent of the time. And for some reason, it, it occurred to me I was like, oh, but you know what else is the candidate who spends either the first or second most wins a hundred percent of the time. <laughs> so you have a situation where only the candidates with millions upon millions of dollars ever win in the United States uh, uh, government, federal government. Um, so I wanted to, you know, the, on this on this same topic, uh, what, do, what do you think of the strength of third parties right now as compared to, you know, 20 or 30 years ago? Um, I know that like they just, they, the system keeps putting more and more roadblocks in. You of course know how tough it is to even get your name on the ballot it is just an endless fight. Uh, you, you know, Matthew Ho is running as a Green in North Carolina, and uh, he got the enough signatures. And then three Democrats on the committee uh, in the legislature just said, oh, yeah, we think these are uh, might be fraudulent. So we're just throwing out all the signatures. And they tried to bar him from being on the ballot. He took it to court. Now I believe he's on the ballot. But, you know, yeah. they, they just threw them out. So 
Yeah. Can you talk a little about the state of, of third parties actually being on the ballot and being a force? Well, you know, the saying is, I think this is uh, attributed to uh, Gandhi from India. First, they ignore you, and then they laugh at you, and then they fight you, and then you win, you know. And I think the empire is kind of quaking in its boots because it knows that its days are numbered. Uh, you know, that's for all kinds of reasons. But take a look at Jeffrey Sachs's appearance on Democracy Now! yesterday, where Democracy Now! actually allowed a, a um, you know, an eloquent opponent of the US empire to actually say his stuff, you know, which is remarkable. Or listen to Noam Chomsky, who was uh, featured on uh, Katie Helper and Aaron Maté's uh, Useful Idiots uh, just last week. But, you know, the, um, the reasons to uh, fight